Ayche. The Lord is risen, risen indeed, hallelujah. Jesus stand among us in your risen power. Let this time of worship be for us a hallowed hour. We ask this in your mighty and matchless name, amen. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God and there shall no torment touch them. Rest eternal grant unto olive pearl, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon her. The first tribute will be done electronically and so we invite, invite our brother Dennis to project that on the screen. In the process of my education from primary to university, Olive Mason was the most profound, loving, and positive influence in my life. The tribute I shall present presents her as I saw her as my primary school teacher at the age of 10 in 1958. Marvel School opened in 1955 a year in which Jamaica was still awakening from her colonial slumber and Norman Manley replaced Bustamante as head of government. The school was one of 99 built by the outgoing government to create space for the 100,000 children found by the Moen Commission in 1938 to have not been attending school. 
We received the compliment of teachers, some of whom must have been fresh out of college. Ms. Brooks, Ms. Gilfillian, Ms. Gray, Ms. Robinson, Mrs. Dean, and Mrs. Fletcher. And our headmaster was Sidney O. Beckles. Teachers were more highly respected then than they are today. And in our undeveloped economy, the finest minds still went into the profession. The Jamaica of my childhood was a land where banks still did their business in handwritten ledgers, where national bread was still delivered in mule-drawn cards, where John Canoe came out at Christmas, where foul thief and bicycle thief could still make the news, and where gas stations left their air hoses out after closing. There was no video. No television. We read books to pass the time and went to the cinema to see the movies. I progressed from A class with Miss Clarkson to B class with Miss Brooks, first class with Miss Gilfillian, and then in 1958, arrived in second class to be taught by Miss Gray, who later became a Mrs. Mason. She was petite when she asked us all to write a composition position on my best friend. While all the rest wrote about the appears, I wrote in part, my best friend is Miss Gray. I love you to my heart. I would like to marry you. I was 10 years old. She collected the essays and gave us an assignment to keep us quiet while she went through the compositions. As she did so, she called out my name. She had read my essay and she had difficulty containing her laughter. I was confused and embarrassed, and we never spoke about the composition. She was the kind of teacher who not only educated, but also inspired. She taught not only the three R's, but she molded character by encouraging us to be well-behaved and to take care of our desks, because, as she said, only pigs like to live in untidy surroundings. General science was made interesting, and on the subject of pollination, we were told the bees feed form baskets in the process of their work. We learned poems like The Little White Road by Thoris Towell. The little white road climbs over the hill. My feet they must follow, they cannot be still. Must follow and follow, though far it may roam. Oh, little white road, will you never come home? Outside of school, I became her favorite pupil. I would often spend Saturdays with her at home and watch her prepare five meals for the upcoming week and then go to the movies in the afternoon with Daniel, who took care of the yard. If I visited on a Sunday, she would take me with her to St. Michael's Church on Victoria Avenue to hear the young Reverend Don Taylor. Miss Gray eventually left Marvelous School and went to teach at Ardennes. I passed common entrance and went to Calabar, and the close contact was broken. She married the tall and dignified Milton Mason, and she had her first boy, Wilbur, and then Gary. Still, we kept in touch over the years, and our last conversation was September 6th, her birthday, and she was mightily pleased to know that I had remembered her birthday, which, incidentally, is the same as Wilbur's. Seven months later, she has come to the end of this phase of her life. In life's journey, some of us have an opportunity to, influ to influence other lives, and this is especially so in the teaching profession. Aunt Olive used her opportunity to be a positive influence in a thousand lives. She represented the best of the Jamaican middle class to whom family, church, school, and community are the rocks on which our nation stands. She was the center of a close-knit, loving family.
Many moons ago, in the early 1970s to be exact, my path and Olive Mason's intersected, and what a life-changing experience it was for me. She was my form teacher in third form at Arden, and because she was such a strict teacher, she wasn't exactly the class favorite. We weren't really fond of her, to be honest. Then in fourth form, we had her again as math teacher this time, and the feelings were the same. But for me, that displeasure was short-lived. This mother of two boys found in me the daughter she never had. I can't explain to this day why she gravitated to me, but I'm glad she did. And as her love for me grew, so did mine for her. And I'll tell you that her love for me was one rung below that of my mother's. And from that day to the day of her passing, she loved me as only a mother could, and I loved her equally. By the way, my mother, being a teacher herself, was glad to have found an ally at Arden. And need I tell you more? As I left Jamaica to study overseas, Olive Mason's love and support took on new dimensions. Ever so often, and I do mean often, she sent me pocket money, lamenting that she wished she could have done more. During those four years, we stayed close and in touch. Then my father took ill and died, and I had to return home. And she was the first person I called. Mrs. Mason was present and accounting for, and when I was overwhelmed at the graveside, it was her arms that hugged me and comforted me, and you'd never believe how much that meant to me. Then I got married, and she was there like a mother hen, getting involved in everything. I can't forget her helping me to hang, cur to hang curtains in my new home. Then the children came, and she wouldn't be left out of the grandmotherly role. She opened VMBS accounts for them, and constantly kept track of their progress right into their adult lives. To the point where, when my daughter was going to Japan to teach right in the midst of the pandemic, she kicked up a holy storm. It, she just refused to accept it. Then she made a statement. These young people, they don't listen to advice. Daniel didn't actually, she went anyway. In 2004, my mother died, and Mrs. Mason was again a solid rock and quickly stepped in as full-time mother, and I'm so glad she did. As time passed, and I watched her health decline, I got sad. That, that was only for a short time, for I know she lived a full and wonderful life. I'll miss her dearly, and I'll be sad, but I have hope that we'll meet again. She has fought a good fight. She has finished her course. She has kept the faith. Rest in peace, Mrs. Mason. I'll see you in the morning. Tribute to Sister Olive. Dear friends of Olive and members of the family, thanks to Wilbur and Gary for making it possible for me to say a few words on this sad occasion as we bid farewell to their mummy, my sister Olive. Our other sister, Dottie, and myself here in Canada are heartbroken and saddened that as the youngest of three in our family, she's the first to leave us. And more so, it is because we are unable to travel to say our goodbye in person and to wish her a safe travel, God willing, to the other side. Although the three of us had not been together for many, many years, it is the shared memories of growing up together back home in Buff Bay, Greenvale, Highgate and Kingston, 
that will allow us to remember our little sister. For myself in particular, I am more saddened when I realize that Oliver and I will no longer be able to talk to each other. We usually did every two or three weeks about mutual friends or family in what has become a shrinking circle or to reminisce about going to school or about living in different neighborhoods. In more recent years, our conversation would often include the weather conditions here and there, like snowstorms or hurricanes. Sorry you didn't get to say a real snowstorm, Olive. Anyway, Olive, we feel that you are now reunited with Ma and Pa and Milton. While we here will have Wilbur, Gary, and their families, including the grandchildren, of course, by which to remember you. In closing, both Dottie and myself here wish to say many, many thanks to Paulette and Roy, who, as immediate care caretakers over some, over some 30 odd years, took care of you through good times and rough times, and in a sense, represented us in absentia to help you reach 88 years. Bye-bye, safe travel, and God bless. We will always remember you until it is our turn to be reunited as a threesome. Neville. And this one is titled um, Olive Pearl Mason. It says, Dear Father Jackson, my name is Eddie Aleen, and I am the former rector of the Episcopal Church of the Advent, New York, where Jackie, Will, two exceptional and wonderful persons, and the entire family are communicant members in good standing and are actively involved in the mission and ministry. I joined with Mother Abby Murphy, the present incumbent, my own family, and all at the Church of the Advent in sending our love and heartfelt sympathy to our special and dear friends in the Mason family at the passing of Darius Olive. We will continue to uphold our dear ones in prayer. Thank you too, Father Jackson, for the pastoral support you have offered the family at this time. May Olive rest in peace, the Reverend Canon Eddie Aline. Good evening, everybody. As I reflect on mommy's life, it's an honor for Gary and I to call her mom. If you take a moment to glance on the person beside you, the one thing that you and that person have in common is that you knew mom and cared about her. I'm sure that everyone here has a story that they can share about mommy, and we could spend many hours here Gary and I are really grateful for each and every one of you here in person or on the live stream for taking the time to celebrate Mommy's life with us today. From birth, Gary and I had a special bond with Mommy as we shared the same birthday, September the 6th. How special is that? Growing up, it was always fun to wish each other happy birthday and exchanging presents. Even as adults, Gary and I always made sure that we took time out to celebrate that special day with mommy, regardless of the distance, as we were only a phone call away. I've been told that mommy and I were true Virgos, as we both are very detailed individuals. We would always plan activities way ahead of time, and everything must always be structured. Mommy did a good job in preparing Gary and I to be independent and be able to do basic household chores from Gary cooking breakfast on a Saturday morning to me assisting with the washing of clothes. 
Gary does make a very good mackerel and banana breakfast. And may I add, with absolutely no bones in there. Mommy taught us well. I remember a few weeks before leaving Jamaica to study in the USA, Mommy told me that she thought it best that I should learn how to iron my shirts, as the USA would not be the same as Jamaica. So we did a crash course in ironing, and as she predicted, coming to the USA was not a bed of roses, and I had to do my own ironing. And boy, was I thankful for her foresight. As Daddy did not drive, Mommy had the responsibility to teach us how to drive, and she did a very good job of that. One bad habit that she passed on to us was that, was that lead foot that she had. She was known to hit that gas pedal when other motorists were driving too slowly, and I have paid for inheriting that trait by being pulled over by police officers, which, which sometimes resulted in me paying significant speeding fines. Mommy was that cool mom that my friends respected and would have good conversations with on virtually any topic. I never really thought about her in this light until friends reached out to me remembering their own conversations with her. The freshly baked raw cakes that, were, that they were able to nibble on, the bully beef sandwiches that were devoured, and let's not forget her amazing homemade buns. I can tell you that I always looked forward to her sending me my Easter buns after I left Jamaica. A few friends have temporarily stayed with us due to personal circumstances, and mommy did not hesitate to open her door and let them feel welcome to stay. So that is our cool mom that our friends adored and loved. Mommy was also grandma. She had three grandchildren, Matthew, my nephew, Janelle, and Zara. Oh, she loved her grandkids. Mommy was very instrumental in Matthew's early life, and they had an extremely close bond. Matthew always made the time to stop by the house, if only to say hi to his grandma and make sure she, that she was good and then leave. Mommy made sure that she was in New York shortly after Janelle was born and was actually in New York when Zara was born as she assisted us with the very hectic newborn activities. The assistance that Mommy provided after both births were invaluable. Mommy and the girls have always kept in touch, calling her on her magic jack, and there is never a conversation that I had I've had with her that she did not ask for them, finding out what was going on with their lives, be it dancing, school, work, or any, acti or any activities that they were involved in. Mommy did not have any daughters, but she inherited two, as in Andrea, Gary's wife, and Jackie, my wife. Mommy has embraced them like they were her own daughters. It is so refreshing to see the bond between them, and I'm very grateful for Mommy letting them into the, her space as she was truly a very private person. Mommy taught at Arden for several years. As an adult, adult, I was fortunate to have become friends with several people that she taught at Arden. I was told that she was a very strict math teacher and got the nickname Little Wicked. This was based on her height and also being a very strict teacher. Needless to say, she was surprised when I found out and we laugh about the nickname when I meet more of our Arden students and they share some of their math class experiences. Um, Reverend Jackson has asked that I keep the tribute to a reasonable length, but I must mention two of Mommy's other families. Her co-workers are CDPU, NCC, and also the St. John's Church family. Her co-workers were definitely a second family. I grew up with many of those ladies and gentlemen as Gary and I visited Mommy's job fairly frequently. They were co-workers, but I remember them spending many hours on the phone outside of the work environment. I'm not going to call names as I'm, I'm afraid that I may miss someone, but those here today or those watching the live stream know who you are. The lives she has changed either from them learning on the job or she recommended them for jobs in the information technology field based on their skill set has left an indelible mark on their lives. Mommy had a very close church family. She participated in many activities and was always willing to help out in church ministries when needed. She built great relationships and was still in contact with several of the congregants up until the week before her passing. As you can see, Mommy was the matriarch of the family. Gary and I have some big shoes to fill. She was small in stature, 
but she had a big heart and a lot of love for her family. She always took the time to ensure that we were okay, always giving advice or her perspective on our situation. As Gary said in a recent conversation, she was a glue for the family over all these years. She was the one who kept everything together and was instrumental in making things happen for the family. Rest well, mommy. You and daddy did an amazing job in creating a legacy and standards that Gary and I will continue to live by until we meet again on the other side.
standing for prayer. Jesus said, I am resurrection and I am life. Any who believe in me, though they die, yet will they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we remember before you today your daughter, your servant, our sister, Olive Pearl. We pray that having opened her the gates of a larger life, you will receive her more and more into your joyful service, that with all who served in the past, she may share in the eternal victory of Jesus Christ our Lord. He who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and forever. Amen. We sit for the reading of Scripture. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1 through 3. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 2 through 7. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who has seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost, without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. The word of the Lord.
The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. And may this time of worship be unto us and for us a hallowed hour. We pray in your mighty and matchless name. Amen. Do sit, please. Let me greet you in the mighty name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of his resurrection, may we continue to pray that will make us strong to overcome. Let me also, on behalf of all of us gathered here, and on behalf of the fellowship that meets here at the Church of St. John the Evangelist, extend to the sons and their families, to the siblings and their families of our dear Olive Pearl, of our heartfelt condolences. We say, fare ye well to one whom you knew and loved, but the one also whom you shared with us, because many of us have the distinct honor and pleasure of sharing in life with her. Wilbur spoke of the church family. I too benefited from herself and her dear Milton. There were two very genteel persons, I used to call them. And they were always a source of comfort and strength to me whenever there was an, any challenge that I had to face. They were always there. Him too tall and she too, too short. But they would draw close to me and minister to me. And that is a wonderful thing when, as pastor, people will draw close to you and make you feel that sense of comfort and love that is necessary. Olive Pearl would have heard me, as many of you who are members of this church would have heard me say that one of the things I've asked the Lord for is if he was going to give me a choice of my time to die, he would allow me to die at Easter. Because you see, Easter is the prince, the king of all the festivals of the church. It's a time when the church bursts out in glorious hallelujahs. Because you see, death lost its prey. Yes, Jesus Christ burst the gates of death and hell and opened the kingdom of heaven to all who would believe. Yes, we can burst out in our joyful hallelujahs because he conquered not just sin, he conquered death and by the power of his resurrection he opened the kingdom to all. You see, my friends, it is through, in and through baptism, that we are united with God in Christ. And we who are united with God in Christ, we share in the joy of his resurrection. And we know that, as the songwriter says, in that hymn we have in our hymnal now, Lo in the grave he lay, the last stanza, you know it? The songwriter says, death could not keep its prey. Jesus, my savior. He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. Then what? Up from the grave, he arose. 
and with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain of death, and he lives forever. You ask me how I know he lives? By the power of his resurrection, he lives within my heart, and your heart, and all our hearts. So that is why, you see, guys, I have asked, and I kind of envy is a deadly sin, eh? but I kind of envy Olive Pearl now, because she got the blessing of dying at Easter time. And I've asked the Lord, I said, please, Lord, if you're going to give me a choice, let me die at Easter, when the joy of the power of resurrection can continue to guide us. But briefly, I want to invite you to meditate with me for a few more minutes on words from the second reading done by her granddaughter. That is from the Revelation to John, chapter 21. And we had two to six, but I want to begin from verse one. Because here the writer is speaking about the new Jerusalem. And from verse one, the writer says that there are ways in which senses are used to appreciate God and to appreciate things that God does for us. And so he highlights a few that I want to raise. The apostle begins by using the sense of sight and the sense of hearing. So he says in verse 1 of chapter 21, then I saw. I saw what? A new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. The apostle saw something. The apostle saw newness. The apostle saw not the old way, but the apostle saw the new thing that God had promised he was going to do in the midst of his people. A new thing I will do for you. And this new thing, the apostle separated from Kith and Kin on the Isle of Patmos. And remember when I was in the parish, some of us had the pleasure of going down there. And so we were on the Isle of Patmos where John sat. They have a little church built there now. And John sat right there. And it is there that John was caught up. And he saw the new heaven. And he saw the new earth. My friends, when we look in the world today, there's so much of the old that we see. And sometimes we want to stay with the old because we're comfortable. You know, it's like when you have an old shirt and it fits you and it stretches out in places where you start to stretch and so you don't want to give it up. So you stay with it. There's a sense in which the old is familiar and brings comfort, but we need to understand that God's old things are being made new. And yes, when he saw the new heaven and the new earth, he realized that the old one had passed away. For verse 5 tells us that the one seated on the throne said, See, I am making everything new. Then he said to me, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and they are true. So I want to invite us and Sister Olive Pearl has asked me to invite us to look away from the old and the trodden paths and to understand that our God is doing, our God has done, and we need to ask him to remove those scales from before our eyes so we can see the new thing that he's doing in our midst. All things are made new. 
brand new. No second hand. No old covenant, but a new covenant. A new covenant in his blood shed on Calvary on that lonely hill of Golgotha. So my friends, come with me. Come with Olive. Come with Milton. Come with all the saints who caught a glimpse of the new thing that God has done for us already. But the apostle also said he saw something else. He was in the seeing thing. Verse 2. He said, I saw the holy city. The holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God as a bride adorned for a husband. One of the things I remember about going to the old Jerusalem was that when the bus reached on that bridge, Bev, you remember? And they called for a stop. I hear a voice call for a stop. Who called for a stop? My father. A blessed memory. I said, what is this man doing? Where am I holding up the trip for? He stopped. He said he wanted to kiss the streets of Jerusalem because Jesus walked there. My father, who's scornful like nothing, come off the bus, go to a door, go down the ground, and kiss the road because Jesus walked there himself. John said, I got a glimpse of the holy city. That new Jerusalem, and John said, it prettier than pretty. He said, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God. And then he uses a, a rather interesting analogy. He says, like a bride adorned for her husband. Ladies, no offense meant. But John never get it right. Because the new Jerusalem prettier than any bride adorned for her husband. And you know when a bride is adorned for her husband, she looked enough pretty, you know. When I was in the parish, I had a wedding at the other church. The bride was one hour and 45 minutes late. Had her sitting there waiting. So I said to her sister, what happened? Guess what you tell me, sir? The makeup lady was late. And she wanted to look the best for her husband. So she waited. So I said, sister, you could have called me. You could have put on a little powder and some lipstick for your face and pretty you up. She said, oh, no. Oh, no, Rev. I had to look pretty for my husband. So sister, you said, go. John said that the new Jerusalem was like a bride adorned for her husband. Sorry, John, you get it wrong. Because the new Jerusalem has no comparison to anything on this earth. The new Jerusalem, John said, is like a bride adorned for a husband. Like. Hmm? My friends, there's so much ugliness in the world today. As we sit here, long before the Ukraine misery, people are dying all over the world. Little children dying of starvation while food is thrown out. Because I'm sure many of us have some food in the fridge that we're short before the week out. And there are little children in the world who are starving to death. So there's a lot of ugliness. And it's as if the ailments that we go through not enough, COVID come. And if COVID was not enough, because COVID has done us a serious blow, you know. Friends, since last year, April, May, I have buried 47 persons. That's a holy. Many of them are COVID. One of them was my sister, who was all right one minute and next minute she was gone. And then when you look at what is happening with the rise in crime and violence across Jamaica, where little boys and girls have guns in their hands and they are wreaking havoc. We need to look away from all of that 
and get a glimpse of the new Jerusalem, the one that is prepared by Jesus, the risen Christ. Because it is he who before his resurrection said to the disciples, I go away to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare that place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me, that where I am there you may be also. You see, my friends, we need to borrow John's eyes, the eyes that he looked through on Patmos, and we need to see the holy city, the new Jerusalem. That beautiful song we were playing as we rode into Jerusalem, the holy city. Last night I lay sleeping. There came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, methought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang, Jerusalem. Yes, John on the Isle of Patmos saw that new Jerusalem, that place where there is no more crying or pain or sorrow. It is that new Jerusalem where the former things are going to be done away with. Yes, my friends, we come on this day, and as we say fare you well to the dearest we have in Olive Pearl, we need to bore the ears and eyes of John on the Isle of Patmos. We need to be able to see the holy city. We need to be able to see the new heaven and the new earth. One last thing. He heard a voice. Verse 3. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, the tabernacle of God is with people. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Boy, I tell you, I need to be saying that enough, enough these days. Because somehow my sister's death is still with me in a real way. So I went to Dovecott two weeks ago to inter a body. And after I finish now, I'm coming back to the car. So I look over to where my relatives are buried. And I say I should go over there now. Lord of mercy. Friends, as I start to move, one piece of ball in start. And I'm in my robes, you know. And people look at me and say, what do the, the person do? Eh? Look like something to him. A piece of bawling licked me. I start to bawl uncontrollably now. Now all my relatives are Christians. Were Christian before they died. So I know that the scripture promises that those who live and die in Jesus, God will bring with him. But this part of me just can't deal with the fact that when I think of my sister, and since my sister had buried two cousins, when I think of those loved ones who were walking with me just the other day, they are no longer here. But we need to use the ears of John on the Isle of Patmos when he said, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God has come to tabernacle with his people. God has come to dwell with his people and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. My friends, if God is, on, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who gave Jesus Christ to burst the gates of death and hell and open the kingdom of heaven, then this God is for us, then, then all is well. So yes, the tears will come. And I can't tell you that tears won't come. Tears will come. That's normal, human, natural. But we mustn't bawl too much, you know? My brother was very unkind. He looked at me bawling one day, I was at home. And he said, I hope you don't bawl like that before the congregation. Because if you do that, the whole of the people are going to leave you in the church and leave the church because you're ugly with your ball. So stop ball. 
I says, all right, it's my sister. Me can't ugly up myself here any time, you know? I says, oh, no, no, I'm in a ball for you, know, you know? <laughs> Friends, we need to know that we have a God who is in the business of wiping away tears. He will wipe away every tear from your eyes. So, yes, the time will come when you think of her and you just laugh at some of the silly things she used to say. Some of the foolishness that she used to say. I learned a new side of them when one of them was ill and I had to go to the home. I said, this can't be the two serious people I see at church. Foolish system I talk, you know. And I have to be there and say, oh dear. You know, there's the other side to them. Our God is going to come and is going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. We need to hear this. I'm getting all teared up now. We need to hear this because our God is able to wipe tears from our eyes. So the tears will come. But understand that this God that we know and love, this God says, I am with you. I am dwelling with you. I will be with you. I will be your God and I will. So yes, I am hoping the time will come when I think of my sister and I won't cry so much. That this God will wipe away all those tears from my eyes. Because he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And he will give to all who are in need whatever we need. To the thirsty, he will give from the fountain of the water of life. But we need to remember. So as we come today, my friends, I invite us to deploy our seeing and our hearing. And to see our God in Jesus doing all the wonderful things he has done for us. And to hear our God assuring us that we are his and he's ours. And once we are united to him, then like Olive and Milton and Lacinth and Donovan and Lenworth and all those whom we know and love, who are no longer on this side, that he will give us the grace and the strength and he will dry up all our tears so that we weep not as those without faith or hope, but we'll weep knowing that someday we shall see them again in the glory of the resurrection. God bless you, my dear friends. God bless us. The Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion. In the mystical body of your Son, 
Jesus Christ our Lord, give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. May all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection die to sin and rise to newness of life. And may we with him pass through the grave and gate of death to our joyful resurrection. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk on yet by faith that your Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Grant all who mourn a sure confidence in your loving care, that casting all their sorrows on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a hope, a holy and certain hope, and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love.
songs of eternal praise, blessing and honor, and glory and power, to yours forever and ever. Amen.
Cause their baptism. In baptism, only prayer put on Christ. Pray that when Christ comes, he will clothe her in life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. 